Starship reaches space again and successfully achieves a number of milestones, a crew of astronauts returns home from the ISS, and we had an interesting launch failure from Japan. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 15th of March, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Okay, okay, so before we go into Starship, I know that's the hot topic of this episode, let's first take a look at this week in launches, the ones that weren't Starship. Kicking off the week, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket on March 10th at 2305 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1077, was flying for an 11th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. Just a few hours later, another Falcon 9 took off on March 11th at 409 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. This launch brought another 23 Starlink V-2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. This is one extra satellite than what has traditionally flown for Group 7 missions launching from Vandenberg in the last few months, showing SpaceX's recent trend of trying to fit more Starlink satellites into each mission. The booster, B-1063, was flying for a 17th time, and it successfully landed on Of Course I Still Love You. With the two Starlink missions this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,988 Starlink satellites, of which 397 have re-entered and 5,132 have moved into their operational orbit. From the other side of the world, an Electron rocket lifted off on March 12th at 1503 UTC from Rocket Lab's launch complex in New Zealand. The mission, called All Night Long, was carrying the Strix-3 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. Strix-3 is a Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, Earth observation satellite built and developed by Synspective. This is part of the company's Strix series of SAR satellites, three of which have already flown on previous Electron missions. Going from New Zealand to Japan, we had the first launch of Space One's Kairos rocket. Liftoff took place on March 13th at 2.01 UTC from Spaceport Key. The flight, though, didn't last too long. Just seconds after liftoff, the rocket exploded mid-air in what was quite an interesting-looking failure. To put this rocket into perspective, Kairos is a four-stage, all-solid-fueled smallsat launcher with the capability of putting 250 kilograms into low Earth orbit. When examining this failure, at first it looked like the explosion could have occurred due to a casing failure on the first-stage solid motor. However, after the launch, the company confirmed that the flight termination system was triggered, so we're not fully sure yet what happened. Space One will obviously be looking at all of the data from this launch, and hopefully will announce more details once they're available. We here at NSF understand that first flights of a rocket are really hard to get right, so hopefully their next launch is a lot more successful. This week we also had the launch of a Chongzheng 2C rocket with a Yuanzhong 1S upper stage, but it also didn't go as planned. Liftoff took place on March 13th at 1251 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the DRO A and DRO B satellites into what is believed to have been a translunar injection orbit. However, this did not actually occur. While the first two stages of the Changzheng 2C rocket performed as planned, an anomaly on the Yuangzheng 1S upper stage placed these satellites into the wrong orbit. The DRO A and DRO B were planned to head toward the moon and test communication and navigation from a distant retrograde orbit around it. We covered this in a recent episode, where a third satellite, DRO-L, had already launched into a low Earth orbit and was likely part of this constellation. Now, it's not clear what happened with that upper stage. The launch outcome wasn't even announced by China until half a day after it happened. So we'll see what happens and what orbit these satellites ended up in, but there might be a chance that they won't be able to perform their mission as intended. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about Starship. We finally had the third launch of the world's most powerful rocket just yesterday, and it was absolutely amazing, both visually and technically. Liftoff of the third flight of Starship took place on March 14th at 1325 UTC from SpaceX's orbital launch site at Starbase, Texas. If you followed our live coverage from yesterday, you may remember SpaceX had to delay the propellant load well into the 110-minute window due to boats in the downrange and concerns about winds during flight. Booster 10 and Ship 28 were fully loaded with propellants, smoothly sailing through all of the pre-launch milestones and, despite the boats and winds, this time no holds were needed during the countdown. A first for Starship! 
Booster 10 ignited its 33 Raptors, the rocket took off, and we finally got to see, once again, those magnificent Mega Mach Diamonds from Super Heavy. Starship ascended through the atmosphere, successfully passing through Max-Q, with all of its engines staying lit all of the way to hot staging. The hot staging worked once again, and this time the booster didn't lose any engines during its boost back burn. This burn appeared to go without issue and put the booster on track to come back to the Gulf of Mexico about 20 kilometers offshore. It was interesting to see during the boost back burn shutdown, half of the engines on the middle ring of engines shut down first. Now this could have been to induce an initial rotation on Super Heavy so as to not need to fire its thrusters to position itself engines first for re-entry. While the initial portion of re-entry seemed to go well, it appeared that the booster lost some aerodynamic control during the later portion of it. The plan called for all 13 inner engines to ignite for the landing burn, then going down to just the inner three for a smooth touchdown. However, this didn't exactly go to plan, and only two or maybe three engines were seen to ignite. Ish. You can see on SpaceX's footage that some of the engine exhaust went green at some point, so there must have been some engine-rich exhaust in there. It could very well be that the booster moving back and forth during entry might have affected the supply of propellant to the engines, hence why they ended up eating themselves. We'll definitely know a lot more about that after SpaceX completes its reviews and updates us on what they learned from this. And there was probably quite a lot to learn, considering this time around, the booster went through a ton more milestones than on the previous flight. While all of this was happening with the booster, the ship was well on its way to its quasi-orbital trajectory, with all of its six Raptor engines firing as expected. Ship 28 not only went into space, unlike Ship 25, it was also able to complete its insertion burn, placing itself on a trajectory that would make it re-enter over the Indian Ocean. We also got some amazing onboard shots this time around. SpaceX had installed much better and upgraded Starlink antennas on both booster and ship for this flight, and it really did seem to have paid off. Ship 28 attempted to open and close its payload bay door, and while it looks like it did open, perhaps the closing did not go entirely as planned. This was the first flight of a Starship with a functional payload bay door, so a potential failure was kind of in the cards, but as usual, we'll see what SpaceX has to say about it. Another goal for this flight was the transfer of propellant from the header tanks down to the main tanks, something that SpaceX at least confirmed that it started, but we'll have to wait and see what the results of that were too. SpaceX was also attempting to perform an in-space relight demonstration of one of the Raptor engines. The engines went into chill down during that coast phase in space, but the computers decided to not fire the engine. According to SpaceX, the decision was made due to vehicle roll rates during the coast phase. And that's something important to mention. As you can see in the footage from SpaceX, Ship 28 appeared to roll over onto its side and always in the same orientation. Now we don't know if that was planned or not, but this may have affected the re-entry portion that came a bit later into the mission. Starship quickly came back down and was still tumbling even as the aerodynamic drag became more apparent. At some point, some debris fell off the side and you can see how there's almost like a wind blowing them all back. Well, that's obviously the atmospheric drag. Soon after that, plasma started appearing. The flaps began to move, but the tumbling became clearly uncontrollable. At one point, we can even see the plasma coming up from the engine section, indicating that Ship 28 was re-entering engines first, so obviously not a nominal attitude. Now, it's not clear what might have happened for this to occur. It could have been anything from stuck valves preventing certain thrusters, or I should say rather tank vents, to open and move the vehicle around. It could have been the software control that perhaps may have used up too much venting from the tanks. We just don't know at this time. SpaceX confirmed shortly thereafter that Ship 28 was lost during the re-entry, so that'll be something to fix for the next flight. As always, SpaceX is not slowing down anytime soon, and the next pair of vehicles are waiting at Starbase for the launch pad to be ready to receive them and fly Starship again. So stay tuned for more action very, very soon. But I would be remiss if I ended this Starship segment and didn't mention that SpaceX has also finally resumed work this week on the Starship launch pad at Launch Complex 39A in Florida. Earlier in the week, we saw workers trimming the upper portion of the orbital launch mount legs to prepare them for the installation of the launch ring. And here's the breaking news! Thanks to our friend Harry Stranger and his eyes in the sky, it does appear that the orbital launch mount for the LC-39A Starship pad has exited Hangar M at the Cape and is awaiting transport. This picture is a radar image from one of Umbra's satellites, and it clearly shows that donut shape that the launch ring has. You can also see Hangar M next door, and obviously, the ring is outside of it. 
That's quite promising, and it may mean that we will finally have the return of Starship activity in Florida. What an amazing week for Starship, you guys! This week, we not only had that amazing Starship flight, but we also had a crew coming back to Earth from the ISS. Crew Dragon Endurance and its crew of four undocked from the ISS Harmony module on March 11th at 1520 UTC. The departure marked the end of a 199-day stay at the orbital outpost for Endurance and the Crew-7 mission. During that stay, the crew completed over 200 science experiments and one spacewalk. The crew on board consisted of Commander Jasmine Mogbelli from NASA, Pilot Andreas Mogensen from ESA, Mission Specialist Satoshi Furukawa from JAXA, and Mission Specialist Konstantin Borisov of Roscosmos. Their return came right on the heels of the launch of Crew-8 earlier this month and a smooth handover between crews on board the station. Ahead of his return, Andreas Mogensen passed the command of the station to Oleg Kononenko, who will now remain as commander for the remainder of Expeditions 70 and 71. After separating from the ISS, Endurance set itself for a return back to Earth, splashing down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida on March 12th at 9.47 UTC. The recovery process was smooth as usual, and the crew is now finally back home. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Stratolaunch has finally completed the first powered flight of its Talon rocket plane. The flight took place on March 9th, and it saw the Talon test vehicle 1 carried underneath the center wing of the company's rock carrier aircraft, the world's biggest aircraft by wingspan. The duo took off from the Mojave Air and Spaceport, flying together out to the Pacific Ocean for the drop. Talon, equipped with a Hadley engine, was already loaded with liquid oxygen and kerosene prior to takeoff. According to the company, the drop of Talon and the ignition of Hadley were successful and achieved their desired speeds and altitudes. While the company couldn't disclose what those speeds and altitudes were due to contractual obligations, it did mention that Talon went past Mach 5 as planned, becoming hypersonic. It then also glided down to the ocean as expected for this mission. The next Talon vehicle, Test Vehicle 2, will target a return back to a runway after it completes its mission and is set to become the company's first reusable Talon. Once again, the first crew mission of Boeing's Starliner has been delayed. But don't be so quick to blame the spacecraft this time around. Earlier this week, NASA announced that it was moving the flight of the Boeing Starliner crew flight test from April 22nd to early May due to ISS visiting vehicle conflicts. Now, if you think about it, there's been quite a lot of activity going on at the station. We've had Axiom 3 going up and coming down, the Cygnus NG-20 mission also going up, then Crew-8 launching and Crew-7 returning. And now next week, we have a Soyuz crew mission and a Dragon cargo flight as well, so there's been a lot of stuff going back and forth. The reason this delay is happening is precisely because of a lack of parking spots on the ISS. Starliner is currently configured to only dock to the front docking port of the station, though will later dock to the Zenith port on future missions, but to use that docking port, Crew-8 would need to relocate. But then there's also the upcoming Cargo Dragon docking to the other docking port, so it's quite the juggle to be honest. But in any case, despite the slight delay, everything seems to still be on track for the qualification of Starliner ahead of its first crewed mission, and hopefully we get to see it get off the ground soon. And now let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. After two delays in a row, Falcon 9 is going to attempt to launch the Starlink Group 644 mission later today from Launch Complex 39A. The four and a half hour launch window is set to open on March 15th at 2239 UTC. Then going into next week, we'll have the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket with more Starlink satellites from Vandenberg. The four and a half hour window is set to open on March 19th at 220 UTC. Rocket Lab is yet again preparing for the launch of one of its Electron rockets, but this time from Wallops, Virginia. The company's Live and Let Fly mission for the National Reconnaissance Office is set to take place on March 20th in the early morning local time. The next Soyuz crew is about to launch to the ISS very soon. The launch of the Soyuz MS-25 mission is set for next week on March 21st at 1321 UTC. The spacecraft is planned to execute a rapid two-orbit rendezvous, docking with the station's Prashal module at 1639 UTC on the same day. Right on the heels of that launch, another ISS mission will be taking place that same day from Florida. SpaceX's CRS-30 mission is currently planned to launch on March 21st at 2055 UTC. Dragon will then be docking to the Zenith port of the ISS Harmony module on March 23rd at 1130 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.